The Dunwich Horror by H. P. Lovecraft Chapter 9 Friday morning, Armitage, Rouse and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant, but even in the brightest sunlight, a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover about the strangely domed hills and the deep, shadowy ravines of the stricken region. Now and then, on some mountain top, a gaunt circle of stones could be glimpsed against the sky. From the air of hushed fright at Osborne's store, they knew something hideous had happened, and soon learned of the annihilation of the Elmer Fry house and family. Throughout that afternoon, they rode around Dunwich, questioning the natives concerning all that had occurred, and seeing for themselves, with rising pangs of horror, the drear Fry ruins, with their lingering traces of the tarry stickiness, the blasphemous tracks in the Fry yard, the wounded Seth Bishop cattle, and the enormous swaths of disturbed vegetation in various places. The trail up and down Sentinel Hill seemed to Armitage of almost cataclysmic significance, and he looked long at the sinister altar-like stone at the summit. At length, the visitors, apprised of a party of state police which had come from Aylesbury that morning in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the Fry yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with the policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then old Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. God, he gasped. I told him not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody'd do it with them tracks and that smell and the whippoorwills are screeching down there on the dark and noonday. A cold shudder ran through the natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. Negotium perambulans in tenebris. The old librarian rehearsed the formula he had memorised and clutched the paper containing the alternative one he had not memorised. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice, beside him, took from a valise a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big game rifle on which he relied, despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. Armitage, having read the hideous diary, knew painfully well what kind of manifestation to expect, but he did not add to the fright of the Dunwich people by giving any hints or clues. He hoped that it might be conquered without any revelation to the world of the monstrous thing it had escaped. As the shadows gathered, the natives commenced to disperse homeward, anxious to bar themselves indoors despite the present evidence that all human locks and bolts were useless before a force that could bend trees 
and crush houses when it chose. They shook their heads at the visitor's plan to stand guard at the fry ruins near the glen, and, as they left, had little expectancy of ever seeing the watchers again. There were rumblings under the hill that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while, a wind sweeping up out of cold spring glen would bring a touch of ineffable fetter to the heavy night air. Such a fetter as all three watchers had smelled once before, when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanely, and the night sounds ceased. It was a grey, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. The men from Arkham were undecided what to do, seeking shelter from the increasing rainfall beneath one of the few undestroyed fry outbuildings. They debated the wisdom of waiting, or of taking the aggressive and going down into the glen in quest of their nameless monstrous quarry. The downpour waxed in heaviness, and distant peals of thunder sounded from far horizons. Sheet lightning shimmered, and then a forky bolt flashed near at hand, as if descending into the accursed glen itself. The sky grew very dark, and the watchers hoped that the storm would prove a short, sharp one followed by clear weather. It was still gruesomely dark when, not much over an hour later, a confused babble of voices sounded down the road. Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen men, running, shouting and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words the Arkham men started violently when those words developed a coherent form. Oh my god! Oh my god! The voice choked out. It's a goin again, and this time I die. It's out. It's out and moving this very minute. And only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all. The speaker panted into silence. And another took up his message. <laughs> Nigh an hour ago, Zeb Whiteley here heard the phone ringing, and it was Miss Corey, George's wife, that lives down by the junction. She says the hired boy Luther was driving in the chaos from the storm out of the big boat when he sees all the trees abandoned in the mouth of the glen, opposite side to this, and smelt the same awful smell like he smelt when he found the big tracks last Monday morning. And she says, he says, there was a swishing lapping sound, more nor what the bending trees and bushes could make. And all of a sudden the trees along the run began to get pushed to one side. And there was an awful stomping and splashing in the mud. But mind you, Luther, he didn't see nothing at all, only just the bending trees and underbrush. Then through a head where Bishop's Brook goes under the rut, he heard an awful creaking and straining on the bridge, and says he could tell the sound of wood are starting to crack and split. And all the whiles he never see a thing, only them trees and bushes abandoned. And when the swishing sound got very far off on the road towards Wizard Whiteley's and Sentinel Hill, Luther he had the guts to stare up where he'd heard it first and looked at the ground. It was all mud and water, and the sky was dark, and the rain was wiping out all tracks about as fast as could be. The beginning at the glen mouth, while the trees had moved, there were still some of them awful prints, big as a barrel, like a scene Monday. 
At this point, the first excited speaker interrupted. But that ain't the trouble now. That was only the start. Zeb here was calling folks up and everybody was listening in when a call from Seth Bishop's cut in. His housekeeper Sally was carrying on fit to kill. She just seed the trees abandoned beside the rod and says there was a kind of mushy sound like an elephant puffing and treading a heading for the house. Then she up and spoke sudden of a fearful smell and says her boy Chauncey was a screaming as how it was just like what he smelled up at the Wheatley Ruins Monday morning. And the dogs was all barking and whining awful. And then, and then she let out a terrible yell and says the shed down the road had just caved in, like the storm had blown it over. Only the wind wasn't strong enough to do that. Everybody was a listening, and we could hear lots of folks on the wire gasping. All to once, Sally, she yelled again, says the front yard picket fence had just crumpled up. But they want no sign of what had done it. Then, then everybody on the line could hear Chauncey and old Seth Bishop are yelling too. And Sally was shrieking about something heavy had stuck the house. Not lightning nor nothing, but something heavy again the front that kept it launching itself again and again. Where you couldn't see nothing about the front windows. And then, and then, lines of fright deepened on every face, and Armitage, shaken as he was, had barely poise enough to prompt the speaker. And then, Sally, she yelled out, I'll help, the houses are caving in. And on the wire, we could hear a terrible crashing, and a whole flock of screaming. Just like when Elmer Fry's place was to only worse. The man paused, and another of the crowd spoke. That's all. Not a sound, nor squeak of the phone out of that. Just still like. We that here had got our fords and wagons and rounded up as many able-bodied men folks as we could get at Corey's place and come up here to see what you thought best to do. Not but what I think is the Lord's judgment for our inquiries that no mortal can ever set aside. Armitage saw the time for positive action had come and spoke decisively to the faltering group of frightened rustics. We must follow it, boys, he said. He made his voice as reassuring as possible. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You men know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well, this thing is a thing of wizardry, and must be put down by the same means. I've seen Wilbur Whateley's diary, and read some of the strange old books he used to read, and I think I know the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take the chance. It's invisible, I knew it would be, but there's powder in this long distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world escaped. Now we've only this one thing to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm, so we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. We must follow it. And the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I've got an idea. There might be a shorter cut across lots. How about it? The man shuffled about a moment. Then Errol Sawyer spoke softly, pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across the lower meadow here, wading the brook at the low place and climbing through Carrier's Mowing and the timber lot beyond. There comes out the upper road mighty nice Seth's. A little to the other side. Armitage, then Rice and Morgan started to walk in the direction indicated, and most of the natives followed slowly. The sky was growing lighter and there were signs that the storm had worn itself away. 
When Armitage inadvertently took a wrong direction, Joe Osborne warned him and walked ahead to show the right one. Courage and confidence were mounting, though the twilight of the almost perpendicular wooded hill which lay towards the end of their shortcut and among whose fantastic ancient trees they had to scramble as a palada, put these qualities to a severe test. At length they emerged on a muddy road to find the sun coming out. They were a little beyond the Seth Bishop place, but bent trees and hideously unmistakable tracks showed what had passed by. Only a few moments were consumed in surveying the ruins just around the bend. It was the fry incident all over again, and nothing dead or living was found in either of the collapsed shells which had been the bishop, house and barn. No one cared to remain there amidst the stench and tarry stickiness, but all turned instinctively to the line of horrible prints leading on towards the wrecked Whateley farmhouse and the altar-crowned slopes of Sentinel Hill. As the men passed the site of Wilbur Whateley's abode, they shuddered visibly and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. Armitage produced a pocket telescope of considerable power and scanned the steep green side of the hill. Then he handed the instrument to Morgan, whose sight was keener. After a moment of gazing, Morgan cried out sharply, passing the glass to Errol Sawyer and indicated a certain spot on the slope with his finger. Sawyer, as clumsy as most non-users of optical devices are, fumbled a while, but eventually focused the lenses with Armitage's aid. When he did so, his cry was less restrained than Morgan's had been. God almighty! The grass and bushes is a-moving. It's a-going up, slow-like, creeping. Up to the top this minute, heaven only knows what for. Then the germ of panic seemed to spread among the seekers. It was one thing to chase the nameless entity, but quite another to find it. Spells might be all right, but suppose they weren't. Voices began questioning Armitage about what he knew of the thing, and no reply seemed quite to satisfy. Everyone seemed to feel themselves in close proximity to phases of nature and of being utterly forbidden and wholly outside the sane experience of mankind. Chapter 10 In the end, the three men from Arkham Old, white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-grey Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan, ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained on the road. And as they climbed, they were watched closely by those among whom the glass was passed around. It was hard going, and Armitage had to be helped more than once. High above the toiling group, the great swath trembled as its hellish maker repassed with snail-like deliberateness. Then it was obvious that the pursuers were gaining. Curtis Whateley of the Undecayed Branch was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. 
This indeed proved to be true, and the party were seen to gain the minor elevation only a short time after the invisible blasphemy had passed it. Then Wesley Corey, who had taken the glass, cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held, and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that his sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Two or three men shut their eyes, but Curtis Whitley snatched back the telescope and strained his vision to the utmost. He saw that Rice, from the party's point of advantage above and behind the entity, had an excellent chance of spreading the potent powder with marvellous effect. Those without the telescope saw only an instant's flash of grey cloud. A cloud about the size of a moderately large building, near the top of the mountain. Curtis, who held the instrument, dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumbled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan half inaudibly. Oh, oh great God, that, that. There was a pandemonium of questioning and only Henry Wheeler thought to rescue the fallen telescope and wipe it clean of mud. Curtis was past all coherence, and even isolated replies were almost too much for him. <laughs> Bigger than a barn, all made of squirming ropes. Whole thing, sort of shaped like a hen's egg, bigger than anything. With dozens of legs, like hog's head, that half shut when they step. <laughs> Nothing solid about it. Or like jelly and made of separate wriggling ropes pushed close together. <laughs> Great bulging eyes all over it. Ten or twenty mouths or trunks are sticking out all along the sides. Bigger stove, stove pipes and all are tossing and opening and shutting. All grey with kind of blue or purple rings. And God in heaven, that hair face on the top. This final memory, whatever it was, proved too much for poor Curtis, and he collapsed completely before he could say any more. Fred Farr and Will Hutchins carried him to the roadside and laid him on the damp grass. Henry Wheeler trembling, turned the rescue telescope to the mountain to see what he might. Through the lenses were discernible three tiny figures, apparently running towards the summit as fast as the steep incline allowed. Only these, nothing more. Then everyone noticed a strangely unseasonable noise in the deep valley behind and even in the underbrush of Sentinel Hill itself. It was the piping of unnumbered whippoorwills, and in their shrill chorus there seemed to lurk a note of tense and evil expectancy. Errol Sawyer now took the telescope and reported the three figures standing on the topmost ridge virtually level with the altar stone, but at a considerable distance from it. One figure, he said, seemed to be raising its hands above its head at rhythmic intervals. And as Sawyer mentioned the circumstance, the ground seemed to hear a faint, half-musical sound from the distance, as if a loud chant were accompanying the gestures. The weird silhouette on that remote peak must have been a spectacle of infinite grotesqueness and impressiveness. 
but no observer was in a mood for aesthetic appreciation. I guess he's saying the spell, whispered Wheeler as he snatched back the telescope. The whippoorwills were piping wildly, and in a singularly curious irregular rhythm, quite unlike that of the visible ritual. Suddenly, the sunshine seems to lessen without the intervention of any discernible cloud. It was a very peculiar phenomenon, and was plainly marked by all. A rumbling sound seemed brewing beneath the hills, mixed strangely with a concordant rumbling which clearly came from the sky. Lightning flashed aloft, and the wandering crowd looked in vain for the portents of a storm. The chanting of the men from Arkham now became unmistakable, and Wheeler saw through the glass that they were raising their arms in the rhythmic incantation. From some farmhouse far away came the frantic barking of dogs. The change in the quality of the daylight increased and the crowd gazed about the horizon in wonder. A purplish darkness, born of nothing more than a spectral deepening of the sky's blue, pressed down upon the rumbling hills. Then the lightning flashed again, somewhat brighter than before, and the crowd fancied that it showed a certain mistiness around the altar stone on that distant height. No one, however, had been using the telescope at that instant. The whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation, and the men of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which would never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born, for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather would one have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It was almost erroneous to call them sounds at all since so much of their ghastly infra-base timber spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so, since their form was indisputably, though vaguely that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed, Yet did they come from no visible being, and because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer, and winced as if expecting a blow. <laughs> The speaking impulse seemed to falter here, as if some frightful psychic struggle were going on. Henry Wheeler strained his eye at the telescope but saw only the three grotesquely silhouetted human figures on the peak, all moving their arms furiously in strange gestures as their incantation drew near its culmination. From what black wells of acherontic fear or feeling, from what unplumbed gulfs of extra-cosmic consciousness or obscure, long-latent heredity, 
with those half-articulate thunder croakings drawn. Presently, they began to gather renewed force and coherence as they grew in stark, utter, ultimate frenzy. group on the road still reeling at the indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills. The deafening cataclysmic peal, whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hero was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. Trees, grass and underbrush were whipped into a fury, and the frightened crowd at the mountain's base, weakened by the lethal fetter that seemed about to asphyxiate them, were almost hurled off their feet. Dogs howled from the distance. Green grass and foliage wilted to a curious sickly yellow-grey, and over the field and forest were scattered the bodies of dead whippoorwills. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day, there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Waitley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain in the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. They were grave and quiet, and seemed shaken by memories and reflections even more terrible than those which had reduced the group of natives to a state of cowed quivering. In reply to a jumble of questions, they only shook their heads and reaffirmed one vital fact. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe. Some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence and in that pause, the scattered senses of poor Curtis Waitley began to knit back into a sort of continuity, so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh, oh my god, that hair face! That hair face on top of it. That face with the red eyes and crinkly albano hair and no chin like the Whiteleys. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing. But there was a half shaped man's face on top of it. And it looked like Wizard Whiteleys. Only it was yards and yards across. 
He paused, exhausted, as the whole group of natives stared in a bewilderment not quite crystallized into fresh terror. Only old Zebulon Whateley, who wanderingly remembered ancient things but who had been silent heretofore, spoke aloud. Fifteen years gone, he rambled. I heard old Whateley say as hell some day we'd hear a child living his a call in his father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to question the Arkham man anew. What was it anyhow? And however did John Wizard Whiteley call it out of the air to come from? Armitage chose his words carefully. It was... Well, it was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside, and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. I'm going to burn his accursed diary. And if you men are wise, you'll dynamite the altar stone up there and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Waitleys are so fond of. The beings they were going to lead intangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to this thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big from, from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big. But it beat him because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. You needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother and it looked more like the father than he did.